Dallas Alexander, Finding Your Flow State, former JTF2, and now singer, songwriter, music maker. I'm throwing this one out quickly, team, so that you are listening live right now and get a chance to get to see Dallas Alexander live at his shows. Jump on the website, dallasalexander.ca. Check out the show notes for his link tree, uh, all the awesome things he's got going on, on YouTube, Apple Music, Spotify, and Patreon. We had an amazing chat about his world record sniper shot, 3,540 meters long. Uh, as a team, uh, the, uh, the truth behind that shot. We talked about a range of things. Uh, we even crowdsourced some questions about selection, uh, <laughs> Canadian coffee, uh, advice for, for people going uh, into the Special Forces. Uh, we talked about his brother and his, the inspiration that uh, uh, started to start writing songs. We talked about psilocybin and how that helped him and uh, helped him gain the tools there to close the loop. It was like, he literally said it was night and day uh, and his magical substance. So that was really interesting. Talked about his daily routine. And as I said at the start of this, his latest gigs and uh, the Horseshoe Tavern is, is one of those ones that's really coming up. So buckle up. It's, uh, it's down and dirty, a, a nice short show with an amazing individual. And of course, now uh, I don't know if it's infamous or world famous of why he was essentially kicked out of the premier counter-terrorist unit of Canada, JTF2. Thank you so much for watching. Enjoy the show. Hi, thanks for watching. I'm Damien Porter, former Special Forces operator, and check out my new project for 2023 at hownottodie.com.au, where I've combined all my Special Forces training and police officer experience to help others. Thanks for watching. And we're live. Welcome to the Straight Talk Mind and Muscle podcast, and welcome to my guest. Almost now, the world famous Dallas Alexander. <laughs> Thanks for having me. Oh man, it's great to have you on. Thank you so much for your patience and all the time organising it. And wow, after it blew up with with Sean Ryan, I didn't even know if I managed to to get a, a chat to you. But it's been been great to to bounce back and forth. And wow, you've got a hell of a story, Dallas. Um, where do we start? <laughs> <laughs> whatever um, you want hey look i, I do the intro um before this so i record a, a, the show notes there so that people have understood uh that you've probably got the the longest ever uh sniper shot or sniper kill in, in history um this may be bounced there but then i'd really like to bounce into to where you're at now with the music as well so man okay. is, is that is that actually a world record was that an informal world record what what happened there yeah, so that was, uh, it was a team of four of us that were deployed. We were in Mosul, uh, Iraq in 2017. Um, I was actually one of the four. So I was a spotter, I had a shooter in front of me, another spotter, another shooter in front of him. Um, and if they've heard you know, the podcast, I've already explained this, but it's, it was really cool that it was um, just the, the team that I was kind of lucky enough to be a part of that worked very slick. We were ready and trained and um and kind of prepared for it yeah so the the shot when when we made it it ended up being a almost an unintentional simo shot from both teams beside each other yeah. uh we don't actually know which team's round hit <laughs> or like it's the whole team uh i think it was us they think it was them uh <laughs> But so, yeah, it ended up being, and it still is, as far as I know, uh, the world record by quite a long distance. It's interesting. I, I interviewed Brandon Webb, um, Navy SEAL um, uh, sniper instructor, him and uh, Eric Davis, who else was on the show. They actually um, were um, tasked with refurbishing, re totally revamping the, um, the Navy SEAL sniper school. And they talked about, I think in Brandon's book, he talked about um, the different sniper uh, shots and 
it would, I think it was held by a British um, Royal Marine before your one. Yeah, that's right. I think I, I don't remember the distance exactly. I think it was around 20, 2,400, something like that. Meter. I'm talking meters right now. Yeah, as we should. Everybody else apart from um, America, right? <laughs> yeah, that's right. So I think it was at 24 plus uh, 100 meters or so. Uh, and what was yours? Uh, ours was 3,540 meters. So it's Holy just over a kilometer. Cow. It's over a kilometer longer. Holy cow. I, I didn't know. You know, I get so many. Vet, it's not a veteran podcast, but I'm lucky enough to have so many veterans on here, but we don't really share war stories because you know, we, we sort of been there and done that when there's two of us together, you know, we, we yeah. go down the other routes, which is really popular, but I didn't know that was so long. That's, um, that's phenomenal. And how long is that bullet in the air for going that far? Uh, it's just shy of 10 seconds. It's like 9.9, 9.89 or something like that. Yeah. You sure you didn't join the artillery? <laughs> yeah. That's what it felt like that day. Yeah. <laughs> man and and just to you know we, we're having a bit of a laugh here and it, it really did it ended a human life but was a lot of people don't realize the the true evil that's over in those sort of places so um is it um going to breach any opsec if you talk about who who you um you targeted so what this was is we were supporting a uh, an iraqi push so from our position there was a fight three kilometers to well between the the range band is about 2100 meters up to 4k and that was perpendicular so the iraqis use my hands here to they're pushing they're attempting to push isis isis back and out of mosul uh so we were supporting that with uh sniper fires mostly but some uh air airstrike calls yep. and so it was it was just we were witnessing who was who was attacking the iraqi push um we're trying to avoid them you know, you know, deploying their VBIEDs and all the different tactics that they had and attempting to do that with sniper fire. And it awesome. uh, was effective. Yeah. yeah, a lot of people don't realize, I guess, um, American Sniper, the movie sort of brought it out. You know, you, you, you're saving lives so many times by, by targeting um, such individual targets and, and helping out yeah. your brothers. And that's what it's all about on the battlefield is looking after your mates. Yeah, yeah, and for for sniper position especially, and well, and most of it is realistically just watching and watching and watching and watching, and then you'll have some periods of time where it's like, and then you go back to watching and watching for hours and hours. <clears throat> yeah, that's a lot of patience. I mean, that's with the pinnacle of your sort of special forces career is around that, I'm guessing. But you know, where did you come from, man? Um, what what got you uh, to join the military? Uh, how many years did you do with uh, with the unit, and um, and then we'll push on to where you're at now, looking like a, a rock star. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I was uh, uh, I'm just from a tiny, tiny, tiny little place in the middle of nowhere in uh, Alberta, Canada. It's a yeah. little, uh, we, it's a Métis settlement. That's what we call it. It's like a small uh, indigenous community. Uh, I grew up there playing in the woods and playing hockey. Those are the two things I did all the time. I'd be yeah. outside, or I'd be playing hockey. Um, I joined the military after my like junior hockey time kind of ended. I'd heard about this unit being our JTF2 counterterrorism unit. I didn't know that we had that at the time. I was a little bit uh, naive and I guess uh, uneducated on the Canadian military, but I found out about it and I was instantly just uh, obsessed with that idea of joining that unit for a lot of reasons. Looking back now, it's like, young man uh unsure big ego am i enough where can i prove it the most and that seemed like the place for me uh so as soon as i heard about it i was like laser beam focus on getting there well let's maybe touch on that because like i said we we hit bigger subjects than, than just a, a basic combat sort of podcast um the ego side of things you, you and I've both been in the unit, so we understand how it goes. But did you tick that box um, of proving to yourself that you're good enough? I think what it did is it helped me evolve into someone that realized that you're already good enough yeah. instead of being like, now I can prove to everyone. It was like, oh, you didn't need to prove anything. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's that's what it helped me to see versus the initial uh kind of chase to be like yeah I'm, I'm 
big and bad enough and I can do this kind of stuff and I'll be man enough once this is done, check a box. It just more helped me to see that I didn't really require that in the first place. <laughs> Hey, it's part of maturity. God, I'm 49 going 50. I'm still still feel like a 20 year old inside and waiting waiting for the uh, the wisdom to come with old age. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, isn't it amazing to be surrounded by such amazing individuals and teams like that? Though, um, Pat Mack uh, interviewed Woodham Moffat. Woodham Moffat was my assault sergeant. Went on to become RSM of New Zealand SAS and now is Sergeant Major of the Army. Um, but there's always people better than you. There's, uh, you know, you, oh yeah. But you're not really competing against them. You're just trying to strive for for better in, in general, aren't you? Yeah, yeah. That's something that I found pretty amazing every day. Whether it's on the range, the CQB, in the gym, any piece of gear, equipment. Like, there's just everyone is so good that it makes you want to be better and better and better. And it's, it's, you're right. You're not necessarily like you'll have competitions and stuff and yeah, you're competing with people and, but you're always competing with yourself. I find, cause that's, it's, you know, you're like, I'm in this kind of company. I got like, I got to step it up. Yeah. That's a perfect yeah, description. It's a, it's a pretty unique thing. I'm definitely lucky to be a part of that. Oh, well, you just don't, you don't find it to, to the, any degree really in the, in the civilian world. Um, on that, and maybe I just pick your, your, your brains, and I am very cognizant of, of OPSEC for you, so feel free to, to, to say no at any time. But JTF2 seems a bit different uh, than the other units. Um, you said as a CQB you're on the range, ours was literally assaulters and snipers. <laughs> it was like that, oil and water, and um, I, I, I won't say the nicknames we had, but a, a sniper won't be coming. He'll be on the back of the stack and hopefully oh, yeah. we can leave him outside the door if we're lucky, you know. Did you yeah. guys mix dip differently over there? Uh, yeah, I think so. Like even in the, so in the assault squadrons, kind of the main focus is shooting and CQB. Um, in snipers, we just kind of added long range to that, but we, we really did try to get into the CQB and with the squadrons as much as we could. Um, but it wasn't our priority or our number one task most of the time. So it would be, it would be a good mix. Um, and we would always like, we were just tasked to go work with different squadrons all the time. So we needed to stay at least <laughs> relevant in those spaces. Um, yeah, I don't know. You definitely get, you get a little bit of back and forth for sure from time yeah. to time, but it's like that with anyone talk about the divers, talk about the climbers. <laughs> Well, I was just getting an ice bath last night. I was, I was thinking, because I do some kind of prep for the shows. It's not all off the cuff. So I'm going, do you guys have a maritime capability? Because that's pretty damn cold over there. Yeah, there's been some cold maritime counters and training days. That's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. Look, um, I'd like to, I've got a whole bunch of crowdsource questions, like I said, but I'm going to throw them at the end because it does change the tangent of where we're going. You know, like I said before, you dress like a rock star. You you changed role completely. I'd like to um, find out your transition journey, and then I'm going to go back to the actual reason that you left. But what's it like now being out of the unit, and what um, what was your transition like? What were you looking towards? I mean, was it just into the abyss, or did you have a plan? What was going on there? Uh, I think for me, um, and it, uh, it's not unique to me. I've, I've spoken to people who have had the same thing, but I was really um, excited about playing music. I was really excited to get going, and I had been had a few years of doing it, um, and I was ready to just like take the next step. So it wasn't a big uh, I'm done now because it can be a, a big identifier of a person a unit like that um where you almost you're like oh now what now what am i without yeah. it kind of thing uh, but i was raring to go so i didn't really have that or i didn't i'm lucky that that didn't set in because i'm like I, i'm appreciative of my time i had a great time and met a bunch of great people and experienced amazing things uh but i'm like i'm ready to go this way now <laughs> so the transition it was no, I'll knock on wood because it's just so far it's been, I've, I've had such a focus elsewhere that it, it, it doesn't feel like this big, uh, I don't know, empty hole in my life. Yeah, purpose <clears throat> is 
there's a great quote, a man without purpose is lost. Um, so what got you into 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 music? Is something you'd already always done? Because you seem you, like we listened to your music last night, as I said before we started recording. It's phenomenal. Well, I appreciate the compliment, but it is uh no, it's it's fairly new, uh, at least to the level I'm doing it. I, I got a guitar I want to say when I was around 18 or 19, and I I just my only goal was to learn a couple songs to play at the campfire because we had a awesome. big like campfire guitar singing culture kind of where I was from. Um, and I was like, oh, I want to be able to pitch in and play a couple songs. So I got a guitar and it was really on and off. Like I'd learn a few chords and I put it down for like six months or a year and come back and try and remember. Uh, it was actually sparked. My, my brother passed away when he was 39, which is oh. now like four years ago or so. Yeah. I'm sorry. Uh, yeah. Thank you. But it, he, it's what's it's what really sparked me to start playing music. He had a recording studio in his basement. Uh, we talked about recording a song together and never got around to doing it just because everything it was always put off. So it was it was a couple things converging, but it was it was that that really got me into writing songs, which I found yeah. extremely therapeutic for that purpose. Um, but then also like uh, the military and the unit and stuff was starting to change a little bit in a direction that I wasn't necessarily for me so all these things converging is what really uh i was like i'm gonna i'm gonna give it i'm gonna give it my all in music and see how so, see how i like it it all all sort of came together at the right time that's i'm quite stunned um dallas because 24 hours ago i was speaking to um elena stott uh mbe and and she's written a whole bunch of different books and things but she was she the same thing um her great auntie passed away and a park, it's not a park of pen, but a beautiful park of pen that her great auntie had forever got passed down to her and she just basically got in and started writing and it was the catalyst, oh, wow. that trigger. And that's, I mean, that must be such a good feeling that from your brother's passing, and obviously that's an, it's um, difficult to deal with, but taking the positive side out of that and, 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 and going forward for, for four years, writing songs and, and performing songs. Yeah. It's uh, I mean, I love, I love doing it now. It, it's such a, it's just so different also than the other career that I had, you know, <laughs> like it's to be creative versus always, I don't even know how you explain it. It's like this in and out of aggression and in and out of, you know, you have to like turn it on when you're here and turn it off when you're here and think over here and this is more just like it's a, a way to have a creative outlet, which is weird, but it's good. It's a therapeutic in a lot of ways. That's a great point. And so many people don't realize the creativity that we have. I mean, a lot of SF guys, um, they go on to uh, become highly educated. You've got um, uh, masters and PhDs in, in UK um, SAS. Uh, you've got well, a, a good friend of mine, Kirk Parsley. <laughs> That's a great story. <laughs> Kirk was in a high school dropout. His um, his teacher literally stated to him, "You're going to amount to nothing. You might as well just drop out." I mean, gosh, goes into, there. oh yeah, yeah, good good education right there. Went on to become uh, join the navy, become a seal, left the seals, became a doctor. Went back to their seals as their as a, like an orthopedic high performance doctor, and now he's a, a a very high performance doctor for for high end people. You know, from a high school dropout. Wow. <laughs> they either go the smart route or the creative route. You know, look at um, uh, uh, so many people. You got Jack Carr writing um, such amazing books. Uh, Pat Mack that I, I think I spoke about, a Delta Force guy doing doing videos for basic do stuff, and it's so creative. It's 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 a great outlet. But a lot of people don't realize about that flow state um, triggers. The three ones that I use is doing dangerous things, creativity, and altruism, and they get me that good feeling that 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 uh, gets all. As Nick Goldsmith says, turns all those dials in your brains for the chemicals. Um, were you very creative when you're in the unit, or was it just just sort of relying on the the, the blow and go stuff? Yeah, I wasn't really. It was more when I started to discover songwriting that there was there was an outlet for it, or I started recognizing it maybe or, or looking for opportunities to be creative where you start yeah. thinking like, Oh, that could be, that could be a song lyric. That could be a song and just start 
and the more you look for it and the more you practice it, obviously, the more you see it and find it. Um, but yeah, no, I was, there's not a lot of creativity coming out of me <laughs> back in my unit days. Well, that does bring me to, when you're saying about writing songs, <laughs> we listen to one and it's a lot about weed <laughs> and, and your mom. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that was one of the first ones I wrote, actually. Yeah. 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 Um, and it, that was like, we, I, I can't remember what year it was, but they made weed legal here. Yeah. And I, I went back to another, my, the province that I'm from to visit my parents and I saw my mom smoking a joint for the first time. <laughs> like, oh, wow. And that's where I wrote the song. about. It. Wow. What a realization for, yeah. for a ch you're still a child of your mom's, but you're yeah. obviously grown up, but what a realization to see it would be a bit of a paradigm shift there. Yeah, totally. Um, I've got to ask the question, man, uh, and you, you, because it's a straight talk show, but um, feel free to not answer. Um, weed is that part of your life now? Being out of the military and out of something that people's lives relied on what you did. Um, yeah, well, like I, it's a mix. It's like everything. I I enjoy it. I think it can. There's some benefits to certain things like CBD um, in terms of health, and there's also some let's say states that it can put you in where like something like a meditation before sleep just gets deep into a very next level. Um, but I, again, you gotta like everything else, it's a balance and I don't, I, I so I can't yet anyway, not sure I even want to get there, but I can't, I can't like play music when I'm, I'm stoned like Willie Nelson or whatever. So it's not, uh, it's not something I can have a big part of my day. <laughs> I appreciate you being open about it. Um, I had a guy, Matt Hughes, uh, on the show, and I'll, I'll put the links down there, but he was a Marine and um, the heathen machine on Instagram. Great guy. But uh, he was at a, um, a concert with his girlfriend and somehow they got some psilocybin and he was in a bad way beforehand, talking post-traumatic stress, post-traumatic stress disorder, all these things. But and listening to him was amazing. He said his, the lights just turned on for him and all he experienced was gratitude. And it's what you don't really, you don't have much gratitude in the military, do we? we, we <laughs> that's, that's not part of our, our skill set. Yeah. And it changed his brain. And um, to see him now from where he was at is just phenomenal. So you can see the benefits of some of these things so much. Oh, yeah. And psilocybin is a good example for sure. I think, um, did you talk to Sean uh, Ryan about that at all? Because he was, he's, even if you watch a look at a picture, his whole demeanor and his, his face has changed, right? Uh, yeah, I, I, I spoke about my experience with it. And it was, uh, I've done three day, three different days now of, uh, and this is spread over a few years of just like a very high dose sit with psilocybin. And they've been about the most profound days of my whole life, I think. Well, if we could, if you could um, uh, talk to that, it's just becoming legalized here in Australia to be prescribed. Yeah. Um, it's going to happen in July. So it just got put on the schedule last month. Um, oh, good. You, you know, the, let's just talk to your experience. What was the before and after like? What was your your mental health or mental state and so on, or whatever you want to, to turn yeah. that like, and what's, what's it changed to now? What did, what did you get out of it? Yeah. So I'll, I'll speak to, let's say the first one, first, I don't know, trip or journey, whatever you want to call it. Uh, I, I was having a really hard time processing, like I was saying that the, the loss of my brother um, and I, it, like, uh, awareness of mental health healthy practices all these different things habits meditation cold and hot and heavy training and like fasting all this stuff i had been doing it just i could not i didn't have something the tools were not there for me to to close the loop on that one with my brother or i couldn't find them at that point yeah um and i had been hearing a lot about psilocybin and some of the benefits and i was like well <laughs> let's try it. So I took a really big dose of it, just sitting here in my living room, like sent, sent the family out for the day. Um, and it, it was literally night and day, like the, the loss I was feeling, everything, it was a light switch. It was gone afterwards. Now the six to seven hour journey 
was the most intense thing I think I've ever experienced. It was the scaredest I've ever been, the saddest I've ever been, the most euphoric at some points. Um, but it just was chiseling away at things that I think I left unprocessed or showing me a different insight that I didn't I didn't have with the limited senses at the time to like see or realize. And yeah, coming out the tail end, I was like, oh wow, that was that was profound. And it and it it almost it made me realize that like or or see or feel, I don't even know the right words, but that you know, the the, the immense loss that we feel when somebody like dies is like because we have all of these expectations built up, right? Like he's going to be there for the next birthday, our next hunting trip, when my sons get married, when my daughter gets married, all that like you, you expect for the next hundred years that these are good. And then things are going to happen in order is the way you assume it as a human. My parents, grandparents are going to die first and my parents, then someone of our siblings, we're going to start to go and then our kids. And when it's, it's out of that order, we get shocked, right? It's like you get, you get hit. Yeah. Um, and it just helped me to realize that, you know, there's a bunch of things not in our control. And the feeling was that he he hadn't gone anywhere anyway. You know, it's not the it's not the same relationship, but like the amount I feel in playing music and everything, it's like he hasn't gone anywhere, according wow. to me. Now. Yeah. So would thinking about what you said, does it bring you to a state of acceptance of of the world and, and the events that you've gone through that were unprocessed? Oh, yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And then it, it just also it's a crazy thing. Like it just shines light on a bunch of different things that you might not even be considering uh, things you wouldn't have thought of conditioning that you've had from since you were a little kid, if you've never, you know, processed certain things properly, but it's a magical substance. <laughs> a magical substance. Maybe, maybe yeah. that'll be the title of the show. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Man, thank you for, uh, for being so open with that. Um, yeah, I've I've only heard great things, and I, I don't use that word lightly from from people that I, I admire and, and trust, and 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 you're one of those again, adding to that that um that mix. So really excited for it to come over here. Um, you've been singing for four years. You're really starting to hit what I would suggest is the, the big time now. Is, um, which is is really great to to see. You talked about you you're ready for that that change. I guess that brings us to the the tipping point, as we call it, for the unit for leaving there. And I know you've spoken about other shows, but I'm going to think for the listener here that they only listen yeah, to, yeah. to you and, and just learning from you. What was the reason and what was the crux that you left the unit and what led up to that? Could you just talk through that uh, sort of journey? Yeah, yeah. So the, the stuff I was kind of talking about is the... the the environment of the unit was changing for the last couple of years. Um, focus started being on other things that I didn't think needed to be at the top of priority lists for a counterterrorism unit. So like our resources and time and all of this stuff is, you know, it's important to put in the hours that we did and do training uh, to stay at a level that we need to. Um, and there was, they were just starting to implement things like you need to do this online sensitivity course for something and i was like you name it there was a course for it like everything from sexual harassment to uh like uh indigenous awareness and uh, pronouns and whatever and lgbtq and like all these things and i want all of those people a lot of people i'm indigenous like to respect everyone but like these courses are seven eight hours like some of them are just like it's so long to log in the when the focus of a machine like that changes to something like that and that's like the emails i'm getting like oh have you done this and that and this and no one's asking like did you go to the cqb today <laughs> Were you on the shooting range today did you work through this like it, it the it started to change and it was the entire canadian forces i didn't think it would necessarily get to our unit the way it did but it was starting to change so already i was like i don't know if this is as much for me anymore um and around, I don't remember the dates right now, it was 2020 or so, but like the, the COVID stuff started happening. And eventually down the line, they uh, they mandated that we get vaccinated for it. Yeah. Um, which I found 
a little bit strange, but I was like, okay, we get a lot of vaccines in the military. Um, and I was just started reading about this one a little bit. I'm like, oh, this one seems to be a little bit different. And then I was like, okay. And it doesn't seem like I'm in the risk uh, demographic. Yeah. So I'm looking at it and I'm like, and, and we've, my family, myself, we've done our own evolution of health, right? Like from not caring to like, now we read all the ingredients in our food and yeah. then all the ingredients in our cleaning products. And then where do we get our water? And then all the ingredients, like, so we really put an effort in um, to all kinds of things. So I'm like, okay, if I'm going to get injected with something, I want to see what it is. I'm like, seems a little weird. And it also seems like I don't really require it for my own like demographic. Uh, and so it's like, I look at it and I did it's sort of like the flu shot. I make the same assessment. I'm like, I don't like the ingredients in it and I'm not scared of getting the flu and the flu. I'm not in a demographic really that's going to die from the flu. Arguably it'll make me healthier if I get it. So I just had these questions and I was like, well, if it's being mandated, I'm like, and eventually came down to, we were ordered to go to the appointment. I'm like, okay. So I went to the appointment as ordered and I told them I was going to pass. I just get, wanted some more time to kind of see, cause there was a bunch of things coming out, right? Like Johnson Johnson, don't take it blood clots or AstraZeneca. Don't take it. Take these ones instead. Yeah. And it was a weekly. A lot of confusion. Yeah. And I'm like, okay, I'm just going to wait then and we'll see. Uh, and when I told my chain of command, I was like, was, I'm, I'm just going to wait. I want to see more time or whatever. I was like immediately threatened to be fired, kicked out of the troop I was in, like by the end of the week. So I declined it on a Friday and this was happening on a Monday. Wow. I never, ever seen a response like this in our unit ever. And I keep, I say this analogy a lot, like I could have got wasted and drove my truck through the front gate and the response would not have been the same. Yeah, you're totally right. So I was like, well, that's a little bit weird. Like this is now just, it just like each level is a little bit stranger. Um, so around this time they started half mandating masks. And so like, it would be, we're in a briefing of some kind, you and me, two other people, no masks. If one person was coming from the chain of command that believed in masks and everyone would have to put them on or like here in this building, not in that one on this floor through this door. Oh, no. And I just immediately, I was like, okay, I'm not playing this game anywhere on camp. I'm not going to partake in this charade. And it's so then like in the military now, after I've been there for 13 years, I've had no administrative problems whatsoever. They'd be like, Oh, here's a paper. You're in trouble for not wearing a mask over here. I'm like, okay, <laughs> throw it right in the garbage. <laughs> like the next one, here's another one. Here's another one. Um, and so the final day was like, I was going to a meeting with our CO and RSM uh, about why. So I tried to write up um, papers like uh, there was exemptions offered in the Canadian military. So I'm like, okay, I think all, all of these apply. So I wrote in and I was going to find out why they were declining all of my exemptions. Right. But in the meeting, you required a mask in the meeting. <laughs> and there's a bit of a, a back and forth with the RSM um, and just, told him that I wouldn't be wearing one and he kicked me out and that was the last day my pass ever worked on our camp it's yeah. so easy isn't it they just they just uh take the swipe card yeah change the, the magnet code or whatever they do but oh gosh it's so wild I, I, your analogy was so so I've seen a guy almost do that and, um, he was out doing four hours of PT to, to puke his guts out but that was it done and dusted never to be talked out again um yeah my gosh I'm I'm stunned and it's not just you Dallas I mean you're you're not a medical professional at that stage but I, I've interviewed many um esteemed doctors and they were saying at that time, they're going, well, this bunch of people that I really trust and all these organizations are saying A, and this bunch is saying B, and they're separate things they're saying, they're, they're, they're opposing, and I don't know what to believe is what the, this doctor actually quoted. Yeah. Um, and now coming out uh, on the other side of it, what a clever thing you said, I would just like to wait and, and, and see how it comes. Uh, uh, going back to when... You said we've been vaccinated with lots of things in the military. The difference is they're a vaccine and they work. You know, when I got jabbed with JEV, there's a one in 1,000 chance um, uh, if I get JEV that there's some really bad things going to happen. And this this shot is going to stop that from happening. You know, they don't inject you with experimental 
Well, we hope they don't do anything experimental on us, right? Yeah, that's right. Well, the, and the military and the government has had a history of, of not giving the best health information, even just in my own lifespan of the military. Like there was, there was a malaria medication they were giving to a bunch of people and I got issued it. And they're like, no, this is it. You have to take this for malaria. And people I, at the time, uh, I didn't take it. <laughs> and people got really fucked up. And there's like, there's class actions over it now and stuff. And that was the government saying like, this is what you need to do. And you're going. And the same with shooting the 50 cal, like this, the, the big uh, sniper rifle that we fired a lot. Like there's, there's, uh, there's damage that happens from firing that so many times. And there was, you know, I'd asked before, like, is there a certain amount of rounds we should fire? And like, yes, no, nah, don't worry about it. And so now at the tail end of my career, I've had a gajillion concussions and like all this, the MTBI stuff. And there's myself and a handful of guys or more than a handful, all my hands and toes <laughs> of guys who have like brain issues from this much impact. And we're just, well, you guys said it was okay. You know, and later on, they're like, oh, sorry. Yeah, let's look into that. And I just didn't want to have another case of like, oh, sorry, let's look into that because I tr blindly trusted and I'm super happy <laughs> yeah. decision that I made. <laughs> so, yeah, that's awesome. So, I mean, I'm, I'm still jaw dropped thinking Monday you, your past doesn't work. Where do you go from there? Where did, what did you do? So I had uh, still some communication, obviously, like I had all my gear, everything, like everything was still in my stall at, on camp. So uh, I just like the release process and all that stuff. And I actually chased up uh, or initiated, I don't know what the right word is, but I ended up being medically released. So I was kicked out of camp, never go back on camp, but I ended up medically releasing out of the military. Yeah. Um, and that's all the stuff kind of, we just talked about. Um, so it was kind of like, I was cleared out remotely, for lack of a better word. It's just yeah. like, where is this stuff? And I'd be texting, go here, and you have to sign this paper to out clear from this building or whatever. And it was crazy. It, it's all like, it's just so crazy that I can sort of only laugh about it. Um, it to me, it just seems so absurd. Like, it, it, there's just so many little things where I'm like, really? That's what it came down to, you know? And, uh, yeah, it's a funny, it's a funny place. Surreal and absurd are words that come to mind for sure. And you know what? A, what a loss. Um, uh, so, you know, is it? Is it trying to save face? Is it? You, you don't know what it is, but I, I think a lot of things are coming out this year and, and, and coming forward as well. Especially just what happened in, in the USA Congress um, the last couple of weeks. Well, dude. Um, I'd like to maybe do some of these uh, crowdsource questions because some are kind of kind of yeah. fun. Um, yeah, and uh, we'll throw them at you. Then I'll, I'll tie it in a bow with where you're at now and and uh, and what you're doing. So, let me see. First off, I think there's a Canadian dude that probably knows you that's asking a question, or or, or just because he's a fellow Canadian, he asks uh, right. uh, if Send you're a, a double double or a regular type of guy. <laughs> uh i'm i just like a uh, shot of espresso or a little like uh black coffee normally a little bit of cream sometimes but i'm not double double is too sweet for me and i don't know what a regular is i'm not a tim hortons guy I'm sorry because <laughs> i know that's what it's referencing yeah it is apparently because i thought it was whiskey and then he said no something yeah. about coffee and canadians will only get it yeah. and he said something tim about hortons. favorite tim bits so i don't know what those things are <laughs> Yeah, I don't really, I don't get those too often either. Sorry. <laughs> They're little tiny donuts. Like, oh, wow. <laughs> like the center of the donut. Uh, isn't it amazing? I mean, speaking of Canadian and, and I'm from New Zealand, I'm in Australia and the, the things we can share. Yeah. Then another dude, uh, Connor asked, and this is probably be a bigger question. Um, what was your selection like? And, uh, and then do you have any advice for passing selections? That's a, that's a big question. Yeah, so selection was tough. Um, and obviously that's on purpose. Uh, that's kind of the only way, like you're, you're just physically and mentally taxed. I think the best advice, like prepare yourself physically, obviously. Um, but in the end, it's, it's, a mental, it's a mental game. 
If you can do 200 push-ups, they're probably going to try and make you do 210. If you can do 300, they're probably going to try and make you do 310. And it's a, it's really a mental thing. So, so get your, your mental head on straight <laughs> dealing yeah. with stress and adversity. And you can do that in many ways. And that's, you know, injecting a little bit of adversity into each day or some type of challenge, I think, I believe in anyway. Um, and then, yeah, just get that quit out of your mind. And that's probably was, the best advice. How long was your selection, Dallas? Oh, no, we do a seven, know. yeah, we do a seven day selection. Yep. Uh, it's, it's kind of part of a bigger selection. So you do in, you have to be in the Canadian armed forces for two years first, and then you can try and pass a PT test, a psychological evaluation and have your chain of command support it. And then you can go on a seven day selection. If you're picked up from there, you go on what is called the assaulter course. And that is kind of a continued selection with the intensity dialed down a little bit because they're trying to actually teach you skills. Um, so the actual selection is like a seven day. And then the saying is selection is never over. So you have to perform <laughs> every day after that. Yeah, ab absolutely. Oh, ours, ours is, uh, we we're talking about a, a guy that, that I knew that was looking at going to, um, to Canada and trying out as well. But I think it was because ours is much the, the same as, as, as yours. Um, let me see. I've got another question here. This is interesting. Uh, Fly Ricky asks, if you're still doing a lot of training, shooting, et cetera, now, or is it all on music? Um, so we'll ask that one first, and he's got a follow on. But are you doing much in, I guess, PT, shooting, all that sort of fun stuff? Uh, definitely try to keep up with the PT. I think it's important no matter what, what you got going on in your life that be physically ready for and that's just it's not like uh i mean it is but i'm not saying that in a way like be ready for a fight all the time even though i think you should be um just in general for your family be healthy for your family be healthy for yourself be healthy so you can do the things that you want to do i think it needs to be real close to the top of your priority list because someday if it's not it will be in a hurry <laughs> yeah <laughs> um so yeah I, I try to keep a focus on that i do you know I, I, the intensity has gone down for sure. Yeah. Um, but I do a lot of like rock marching. Uh, we just have heavy weights in the basement that I lift, do some hill sprints. And then I do the, the ice bath and the, the sauna stuff most, most days when I can. And then when I'm here, I'm at home now for a little while, I'll try and uh, get some jujitsu in, uh, you know, once or twice a week. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. Wasn't around when, when I was in the unit, but a lot of the guys uh, push to jujitsu now. Maybe we'll come back to that. It's sort of a two-part question for him was, he was curious how uh, you successfully manage multiple passions, disciplines, responsibilities in life without getting overwhelmed or stressed, which you alluded to a little bit with the, the fitness, but he's got a good point. You know, there's a, a lot going on in your life. Um, how do you manage those stressors? Uh, well, the best way that I found for me is, is there, there are things that uh, like they take stress away. No matter, like if you go lift really heavy stuff, you're not going to feel very stressed after. If you go do sprints up a hill, you're not going to feel stressed after, at least for a little while. Um, a meditation practice is a good one, in my opinion. And then that flow state stuff you talked about, if anything you're doing gets you into that state, there's no stress in that state. It, it's like, you, you're not thinking about something you regret you did yesterday or 10 years ago, and you're not worried about something that's happening tomorrow or 10 years from now. Um, so I think those practices help immensely. Uh, and you go get in an ice bath in the morning. You, <laughs> you might be dreading it a little bit, walking up to it. When you're done, you're, 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 pretty, you're pretty chill. Um, and then I like to just, like for me, I like to fill my life with things that I'm passionate about because then, you know, the other little like all the shit we worry about it kind of fades away like i'm playing spending my time with my family and i love it and i try to be as present as possible and then with music and i love doing it and learning the business and i'm out of my comfort zone and then i'm in a flow state and something comes up and there's all these little tiny increments of growth um so that's how then there's you know there's things that can help you with productivity there's a million books and apps and all kinds of stuff on it but i think just like really doing the things that eliminate stress from your life as much as possible 
will help the rest of the day flow better. And it's tried, tested, and true that if you do hard stuff <laughs> intentionally, <laughs> it reduces your stress. And that's awesome. Um, last question from, uh, let me see, what is it? Isn't it funny, Instagram handles? Yeah, that's not even going to work. <laughs> <laughs> the best foreign units that uh, you worked with? Oh, well, it would be all of our, our guys in the Five Eyes. Like I, I've spent time with the NZ boys and the, the Aussies, uh, the SAS from the UK, and then the kind of the, the Delta and SEAL Team 6 dudes. Yeah. And some of the Rangers and ODA guys as well. So it's like all of those, that collection, they're the, and I've worked with a lot of other units, but out of those, those five also including us, I guess, that's like they've always been really great like-minded in a lot of ways um spend time with them overseas and we'd do you know work together work together but then also they'd be like shooting competitions and we'd go do stuff and it's just it was always a blast yeah awesome yeah that's a funny one that's a civilian question um that so many people so many civilians sort of wonder about but i did a show i did actually have um pat mack joe hortai and clint emerson lined up it was supposed to be a delta a uh, aussie sas and a, a seal lined up but Pat, uh, Clint couldn't make it, but so we just had it there. But I put that question out and we always answer, answer the same. It's like, you know, we can fit into the, any, any team. That's the thing. There. Yeah, it really is like that. You can just be like, put it over here. You learn a little bit on whatever type of gear they're using. The yeah. US always has the most expensive new stuff, but like <laughs> you just learn a little bit of that and you're like, you're right in the stack, yeah. You mentioned Five Eyes, Oz Kanzukas, uh, for the for the civilians. Um. Uh, or the non-military geeks, I guess, uh, Australia, um, New Zealand, Canada, UK, US. Uh, yeah. When did you join um, your unit? Uh, I, got, I did my selection in 2008. So I was in, I was doing my soldier course and in the unit in 2009. Cool. So you're getting in as I was leaving. I'm wondering if you'd heard about the caffeine gum, the caffeine trials that have been done. Uh, I don't know necessarily about the trials. I know guys that have, that or those little pouches that are almost like dip but they're caffeine i've seen all that stuff going around cool so <laughs> you're from the, the old five eye scientists scientists from all those countries australia canada uk us and of course the scientists that were in new zealand came over to our unit in 2006 i think and i know this because i was going through you know packing some stuff away into storage and i, and I saw my signed form as a soldier as a special force soldier um writing my consent they came over to our, <laughs> our unit. The kid is awake for five five days straight, five days and five nights. And uh, in teams of four, two were fed a placebo gum and two were on caffeine. And thank God I was on the caffeine gum. And they um, they studied us and, and they found that if they if we had caffeine, we were combat effective for 36 hours. 98% oh, wow. uh, ratio in the kill house, all those sort of things. And it was hard, man. Um, there's a lot of stories around and I'll probably tell it in a, in a show next week. But what was really interesting was when I left the military and I got into this sort of semi sciencey space and the wellness space, I read the study that they'd done on us. It was published uh, many years later oh, yeah. on, on this caffeine gum. And um, yeah, it was stay alert. I think it's called this gum, but the, those scientists, they, they hammered us. and, and they, Sounds they, like another selection. <laughs> oh, it really was. Um, but imagine going to selection with already the Special Forces mindset, Dallas. Oh, well, yeah, that would be. <laughs> so that just one awesome. little bit. Yeah, yeah. So one thing they did, um, every morning they, they had a fitness test for us every morning for these five days. And it was, uh, you know, like an obstacle course. And we got better and better as we <laughs> went through because we're just going to smash them, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that would be good. That would be something. Yeah. Oh, that, that was a slow development for me, <laughs> the mindset. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's a culture shock as soon as, you're, as soon as you make it through, right? Oh, yeah. 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 Um, you mentioned a whole bunch of things like ice bath and sauna. You're obviously up to speed with um, your recovery and, and, and physical side, which is great to great to hear. Um, where to now for Delix Alexander um, career wise, and, and and where are you looking to ramp up with um, with your new uh, new career in in the singing business? Yeah, so it's uh, 
right now it's it's my main focus you know professionally i guess uh and it's just to get as as good as i can at writing songs and my guiding light in music is like i want to i want to learn to play or i want to learn to write the best songs that i can and then i want to play songs that i love to people that want to hear them and that's it <laughs> however many people that gets to great if it's a hundred, if it's five hundred, it's five thousand. Awesome, um, but I have no interest in, you know, saying, well, if you do this differently, you can play to more people. I don't care about that. I want to play the songs that I love, that I think are important, that I can connect with people, or maybe pass on a message to the people that want to hear them, or the people that will give them a chance, and that's it. Man, that's authentic. You know, it's literally being your best and and, and being your best for the people that that want it yeah well i think it's the only way that i'm gonna not let it eat my soul <laughs> you know <laughs> like it just if it's a song that i love i'm gonna play it and there's there's there'll be an audience for it even if it's just myself uh but i am excited and i'm, I'm, I'm putting in work into this business to learn it and and uh learn the business side of it and, and try and do all that stuff i've been in nashville a couple times now and they've been fantastic trips uh we're just talking about a date now to go and record for my first kind of studio album yeah which i'm really excited about because some of the songs now we've got dialed in i'm really excited to see how we how we i don't know bring them out in the studio you know because the, the album i have out now is a live album and it was recorded just be playing at a bar uh, so i'm excited to see what like we can do in the studio with these songs we were jess and i were just watching your video of um oh, it was the the one that i i posted in the story today um hombre or um amigo uh, amigo which one? adios amigo adios, adios amigo. amigo um was that filmed in a bar yeah yeah that was just in a in a bar and i was getting into music so i got them to record uh the sound and then i got a guy to come take a video so i could like you know have some content to book other shows really because yeah. when you start playing people are like where can i hear your music where can i hear your music and if you don't have anywhere <laughs> then you're not <laughs> booking a lot of shows so it was kind of just that was a collection of songs that i, I had written at that point and i'm like i need to record this and i was like well let's put it out as an album man it, it looks just top notch it, it really really does wow um this show is going to drop um very soon because i'd like to pay respect to you and and use this to help out uh, your your journey now in, in some small way um so what shows do you have coming up because i know I've, I've watched some stuff on on your socials there what shows do you have coming up um that people can can know about over your neck of the woods yeah, so as of right now, uh, we've got a, a show I'm excited about in Ottawa on April 21st because we're playing at uh, a theater inside the War Museum. So it's going to be a really uh, cool venue. Um, it, it's going to be fun. We're getting, we're getting close to sold out on that one, which is all, also another exciting thing. Um, and then May, I'm going to play at a place called the Horseshoe Tavern in Toronto. And this has been a goal of mine since like I was like, I want to play music this venue has been a big goal. Like every, the Rolling Stones have played there and tragically wow. hip. And like, it's, it's like, it is a, an iconic tavern, if you will. So when we booked that, I was, I was very excited. So that'll be the next one. And then uh, I'll be filling them in as I get them uh, because of the recording process and going to Nashville and stuff to write. I haven't been booking as many gigs right now, yeah. uh, but I'm going to be on tour later on in the fall and through the summer, I'll be having some stuff coming out with the new music. So it's all on my website if anyone wants to follow along. Awesome. And, you know, like I said at the start of the show, I, I do the intro there on video and audio, but um, people at this end of the show, what is your website? Where do they find you? Yeah, okay. My website's just uh, dallasalexander.ca because I'm in Canada. If you look at .com, you might get a laugh, but it's definitely not me. Um, and Instagram is at I am Dallas Alexander uh dallas alexander music on facebook just kind of dallas alexander everywhere should get you in the right direction yeah awesome um I, I'll, I'll pull this part out 
immediately as a trailer so we can push to to sell out that that first show right. and congratulations for making right. it to the horseshoe tavern congratulations on your whole journey it's uh i've interviewed a lot of people man um from um john mcphee shrek uh uh pat mack like i said um uh ollie ollerton and in, in uk sbs and these people have been Dan Pronk, ECSR here, they've been through a lot of dark and wobbly times and over a long period of time. I mean, uh, Shrek and, um, and Pat got out of Delta in, in the 2000s, 2012 and so on. And I have not seen, and, and I don't blow smoke Dallas, I've not seen someone transition and be in such a, a good place um, authentically that, that you've got to. So I have to say, congratulations. It's a pleasure and a joy to, to, to see where you're at now. Well, thank you so much. It's, uh, <laughs> it's, you're it's a fun time right now. Yeah. <laughs> oh, um, thank you so much for coming on, man. I, I hope this helps someone who out there uh, who needs to hear it. And, and I'm sure it's, it's been phenomenal um, sharing your, your story. So thank you so much for your time, man. Thanks for having me. Uh, absolute pleasure. Uh... Hi, I'm Damien Porter, former special forces operator, high performance living coach from hownottodie.com.au. And you can listen to my Straight Talk Mind and Hustle podcast sponsored by realketonesaustralia.com, the best and most effective ketone supplement on the market to reduce anxiety, enhance brain performance and supply twice as much energy as glucose. Thanks for watching.